Hey, welcome back, pop culture nerds. Uh, a couple times a month, Mark and I are usually pretty fortunate where we get to have a digital sit down, if you will, with some of our favorite actors and actresses from our, our favorite properties. And today is no exception as we are joined by esteemed actor uh, and voice actor, Adrian Huff. Adrian Huff, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing tonight? Hey, thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you pronouncing that last name right, too. That's that's something that often people have uh, have how, who, how, oh. Hughes, you know, like that. Anyway. Hugh, oh. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's great to be yeah. here. Yeah. Well, our research department definitely made sure to to double check that. And by research department, I mean the two of us. But <laughs> yes, regardless, we <laughs> we made sure we did that. <laughs> you, you know, Adrian, I, I got to say, I, we always tend to kind of look at social media as a as just a first place to go because we're, okay. we're followers, of course, mm -hmm. and all that. But I've got to say, I love following you on social media because of just how calming some of the things you can put out there can be. <laughs> and the ocean side view is what I'm always seeing right. when I jump onto Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to kind of start that off as like an icebreaker. When did this relationship with the ocean begin? Because you're consistently sharing shots that I'm jealous of. Oh, okay. Well, um, I moved to Vancouver Island about 22 years ago. And so I live very close to the ocean. And uh, I mean, it's just, you know, it, I, I don't want to say it's like a spiritual relationship, but I think, you know, if we remember that we're 75% water, we realize that all of us are, the ocean is all of us and all of us are the ocean. And I mean, I get, you know, there's seals coming around. There's, there was orcas the other day and Oof. it was a lot of fun. And I, I think in terms of being, it being calming, I think like I start my day with cold water swimming. You know, I've been doing that for years and people start oh. saying, Hey, do you know Wim Hof? And I, who, who's that? And then I look at them. Oh, I see. But, um, but uh, the, I, I, I do it to calm myself down because, you know, as an actor, you're quite often like a little, little hyper nervous. There's, Oh, what's the next job? What's going on? And my goodness, well, there's all this kind of, noise going on and i find that it's uh you know if it's calming to you that's great but i mean i, I just post it like <laughs> oh my god this is so beautiful this morning and there i go i post it yeah yeah i, I mean I, I i guess i should say i'm jealous of it i live next to a lake but when i look at the lake versus the view that you have i right. mean it's 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 very stark but uh mm -hmm. you know i guess one thing i will say since you mentioned we're 75 percent water this is just me doing like deep thoughts like Jack Handy on, on old <laughs> SNL. Oh, yeah. You know, if if our bodies are at 98 degrees our entire lives, aren't we basically slow cooking the, the duration of our existence? That could explain how short we live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I'm really happy you went there for a second. I thought this was going to be a boy band reference, and I just was not ready to nicliche this whole conversation. Up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. No, we're not. We're not quite going that far. But uh, one thing I, I will also mention to you, though, Adrian, okay. because if the ocean wasn't meant to necessarily be a calming effect, your poetry definitely is, because you oh do gosh. share that with us from time to time. I do. <laughs> I just, yeah, it's just one of those things that you know. I, I guess it's part of the thing which made me an actor is this sort of feeling of empathy with all things, and uh, you know, and every now and then it kind of rises up and I have, oh. I better write this down and, you know, or, or an idea will come to me and, and, uh, you know, so I'll sort of throw it down, but it's not something I sort of spend a lot of time kind of, I'm a poet. It's just like, it comes and I go, I want to express this. And, you know, and, you know, and, and I guess, uh, I I've been fortunate that I've been able to live a life where I get to be expressive and, you know, it's a nice place to put it on Instagram, though. It's a little shy yeah. making, I have to say, cause it's kind of like, <laughs> Oh, you just revealed something that you believe and people are going to judge it, you know, and, uh, but sometimes, you know, the, the urge to express it sort of overwhelms that, oh, what are they going to think thing, you know? Yeah. Anyway, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun. I, I, I like how of all the folks that I follow, you know, you're going to see a lot of different content. And of course, with, you know, with the, the current strikes and everything going on, of course, that's, that's also a, a big topic, but yeah. It, even though you also, of course, are very passionate about that, it's it's nice to see you know nature on your feed and and some yeah. of these things that you don't see in a lot of other folks who who have an online presence. So it, it it's very fun. But speaking 
of the life. We do like to explore the lives of the folks that we we obviously are fans of, okay. and not to the point where you need to like look through your blinds and see us, you know, on the sidewalk <laughs> or anything. No, <laughs> but no. but more to the extent of we want to talk about some things that Wikipedia may not cover. Okay. And for for a lot of create uh, creative folks, especially actors, we'd like to know what was the initial plan for for what you were interested in before we got to to acting like what was the original plan oh, that you were God. looking to follow um well my mom always says i should have been a social worker that was her great desire for me because i was always the kid who who would listen to the you know adults and quietly absorbing everything that was going on um I don't know. I mean, I, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And then when I was 11, I got into these Saturday morning classes and they were, um, they offered a whole bunch. I could study geology, rocks, um, uh, various other subjects and anthropology. And, you know, and uh, so I, I saw this one said, mime and creative drama. Now I had been kicked out of the choir when I was eight years old. This is back in the days when I didn't care about children's feelings. And uh, so yeah. I like I, it appealed to me because there was a sort of a, the magic of being able to create something. And I, and I just I went into the class and and I ended up uh, um, just like they would start the warm up. This a teacher called Brian Taylor, he would start the warm up with uh, mime and he teaches all the wall and do all that stuff. And that I didn't have to speak was great. And I just got really into the, like the creation of something which is in like an illusion which is compelling to people who are people watching and uh and it just became a, I, I get a little obsessive about things like i get obsessive about dialects i get obsessive about like just getting a physicality just right and uh, i think it all started there because <laughs> i like the details of it were were really appealing to me although i have a lot nice. of actor so friends who say don't just don't tell him you were a mime. Oh, don't tell him you were a mime. <laughs> well, it's true. It's, it's, part, it's how I how I started, and then that, you know, it's a cool uh, thing. Anyway, I was just yeah. say, oh, so you you actually did did mime work then? I did mime. I was I was like I was. Wow. I'm, I joke that if I ever did an autobiography, mm -hmm. it would be called "I Was a Teenage Mime." Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I did, and then I, I got to like the end of my teens, and I was doing some teaching as well of mime and drama for kids and uh and then when i was towards the end of my teens i started noticing british actors on television my parents were our sort of british expats living in canada and um of course there's always like alistair cook coming on masterpiece theater and and so i would sit yeah. there and watch with them and and then derek jacoby came up in this uh i claudius which is an it's incredible, it's an incredibly written and directed uh, series about the Romans. And uh, Derek Jacobin plays this terribly like stuttery, like, and the, the acting was just right on the edge, but somehow believable. And I thought, I want to go and be a British actor. So that's, so eventually when I got to 20, I started auditioning for drama schools in, in the UK and, uh, I got into a couple of them and then uh, went to a one-year course and then stayed in the UK for 10 years and in my 20s. Wow. It was, uh, yeah. Wow. Is it, is, was the UK back then Guy Ritchie style where you could see the lettering of the cities <laughs> from a distance <laughs> everywhere you walked, you know? No, it was pretty, it was pretty grungy, actually. I mean, it was uh, just it was the 80s, right? So, um, you know, punk was just kind of finishing. Like, there were people with mohawks and, and, uh, and, and then... You know, of course, then all like Duran Duran was starting up at Culture Club and that was sort of coming up. But, I, I, you know, I, I was, you know, I was a struggling young actor and I was a Canadian actor in London. And so I decided and whether or not this was a great idea, I decided I was going to be a British actor. So at the end of drama school, I started talking with an English accent every day and it sounded just that bad. Until after about a year, I got to the point where I could actually lose my temper in the night. And so I just became obsessed with this accent thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, all British actors, I mean, all of them can do like a series of accents. And you can hear them doing American accents or, you know, Russian accents or German accents. And so it, for me, it was like a wow, a big deal. But like, I, I knew like dozens of guys who can just like drop into accents and they don't 
think of it any, as anything special. It's just a skill, you know. Anyway, but I, I, I just got obsessed with, you know, becoming an English actor. And, you know, I had a few nice opportunities. But actually, you know, I struggled a lot. You know, I didn't, I didn't book a lot of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, eventually I did. So that um, actually like partially answered answered a question that I was going to bring up, okay. and that is that you you very much uh, you know are Canadian, but some of my favorite roles I've seen you in are you're very very British, and oh, I yeah. wanted to know just exactly how you honed the accent <laughs> right. so well because I would never have guessed that you weren't British hearing you act uh, when you did that. So since you kind of answered that a little already, okay, um, you did mention that like you you will obsess uh, over dialects and kind of really try honing them. Yeah. Have you tried like or have you uh, like successfully honed various English dialects or have you I, found I have it was f- just kind of difficult getting the one? Well, no, I have I have a, have a few. Like my my grandfather came from this very specific place in uh, in in northern england uh cumbria and they have that sort of accent he talked like that so i would listen to him all the time well hello adrian come on up you know and like and it was just this yeah so i work i i just play with them all and and i i used to i i once um auditioned for this bbc show where uh you know peter capaldi doctor who oh, Peter yeah, Capaldi, yeah. Mm-hmm. and you know, in the cut peter capaldi like, incredible actor and i had seen him in this thing and and in those days, um, you, you'd get in, you know, invited into the BBC offices and you'd go up to the third floor and there was Matthew Robinson sitting there and he was, just, so, and they would chat with you. And of course that terrified me and I was going for, knew I was going for a Scottish part. So I sort of like listened to Peter Capaldi in this short movie that I'd seen him in. And I sort of tried to do that in the you know, interview and I'm just, you know, and it wasn't great, right? But mm-hmm. it was enough for him, for Matthew Robinson, at about 20 minutes of just chatting about where I went to school, all this kind of stuff. And he, and he goes, um, so what part of Scotland are you from? And I was like, oh, crap. This oh. is the internal market. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, now is the truth time. What do I do? Do I lie? Do I tell the truth? Okay. And so I said, I, actually, I'm, I'm from Toronto. And as I get, but I got the part. <laughs> and... Uh, but this sort of segues into a, a, a story about the generosity of actors. And um, so when I got the part, I said, oh, God, I've got to I've got to sound Scottish playing Peter Capaldi's brother. And so I said, can you put me in touch with him? And they he phoned me and said, well, why don't you come over for tea? And I was like, oh, sure. And so I went over to his place and he made some Earl Grey and uh and he presented me not only with like my five or six, 10 lines or whatever in a perfect Scottish accent, but he presented me, this tape was like 20 minutes long. And there was like four or five different Scottish accents on, which Ooh. I, oh, like, you know, like a very thick Glaswegian from the Slab Boys and then um, a very sort of educated one. And then, you know, like it's just all these different Scot And it was like, it was just like a treasure trove. Anyway, so I worked on that, and I so I got to work at the BBC as a Scottish <laughs> actor. Um, but years later, because um, tell the story to like people about generosity and about working on dialects and get a, the, an original source, and I'm clearing out a box in my house, and I, f- I find Peter Capaldi written on this old cassette tape, you know, like a real t- cassette. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God. And so I, I stuck it in a player and I found a way to, to try and record it. And I just heard that first little moment of, <clears throat> hello, Adrian, this is Peter. And I went, hey, I can't, this is going to die. This is like 30 years old. It's gonna, I have to somehow save this. So I still have it sitting around. But it was just, you know, that when you remember something and it's exactly as how you remember it, it was just like, it's just wonderful little piece. So, yeah. I imagine the the breath kind of just disappears from your you know from your lungs and your your hands probably shake <laughs> a little right, bit you right. know oh, oh. like it's I'm like, probably oh gonna kill this I don't want to kill it <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah get my pencil out and and, and wound the tape back up <laughs> and right. but not too tight <laughs> yeah yeah I, you know I don't necessarily want to uh live too much in the struggle but at the same time okay. I'm interested in, in hearing about it from your perspective because. We've had quite a few actors on this show who have talked about how they kind of maintain themselves throughout that search, and and, and curious to know what what you did to 
you know, maybe keep your uh, your confidence level up and right. how you kind of navigated that. Well, and um, my, my it, the whole uh, 80s was my confidence was terrible, but I, I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed with being an actor. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I like I have no other other skills. And uh, <laughs> I just I just kept on working on trying to be other things trying and and i had like i had a few jobs and i had one job like i got into a temp agency and i worked in a cafeteria in the kitchen washing dishes until my hands were like this and uh and then i worked signing dead bodies into the perryvale uh, uh, cemetery um i didn't meet any of the dead bodies but i would just you know in my best you know, writing and printing, say, you know, so and so, so and died, and he's in this plot, and okay, the next one, and that, that was how it, and uh, and then I got a job as a a driver for a, a company, and where you would go to a rich person's house, and uh, they would have like a Rolls Royce or a Jaguar, and you'd get in and you'd wear your little coat. Of, your little cap so what <laughs> and, and, you, and you say, where would you like to go today so you know it was, it was very much parker you know <laughs> and uh yeah, so, I, so i did that for years towards the end and until i decided to uh move back to north america broadly speaking but ended up in like i started in new york for a few weeks and i went to los angeles for a few weeks with my you know, my partner and and i just and then i thought well just stop in toronto for a minute and then and Toronto ended up being 11 years before uh -huh. I moved out here. Yeah. Uh -huh. But here's the, what I did do is I, um, in terms of keeping it going, when I landed in Toronto, um, I got back into class, you know, and uh, rather than walking into auditions or trying to get auditions or trying to get people to, you know, how high the, when, when I uh, go into an audition, Rather than going trying to get a job, I started going back into the reason why I do it, which is that I love the work, I love the expression, I love the relationship mm -hmm. building and the creating a character and and acting class. Getting back into acting class brought that back, so that I would that was the engine was running. I was putting new pieces into the engine and and you know getting better at it, so that when an audition came up, I said, "Oh, I think I'm going to try that in the next audition," so that you know, the audition became just another exercise in acting. And then it's, you know, then things started to pick up. But uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, wor I worked as a messenger in a law firm for a while and right downtown Toronto, which is great because like I'd say, I'm taking my lunch now. And it would be like two o'clock or 10, depending on what time the audition was. And I, I ended up actually working more as an actor that year until they eventually said, you know, you're taking a lot of time off. Um, <laughs> are you going to go and do this guest star in a, in a British show um, in Calgary? Or are you going to stay and keep your job as a messenger and a mailroom boy? <laughs> um, okay. So, and then, then, you know, then I basically would be able to, to make a living at it, which is uh, very cool. Very, very yeah, and you know, we yeah. hear... That Einstein did some of his best job, some of his best work as a patent clerk. But you yeah. know, we're we're pretty happy that you've you've made the step from messenger room to to actor. Which I did. What you talk about the uh, talk about auditioning um, and yeah. how you you really enjoy the process. Uh, do you do you enjoy auditioning? Because I know with some actors, it can be almost either tedious or like it's it's a very very stressful part because you, like you did mention like you're trying to get a job and you're always yeah. trying to get a job when you're acting it's a so very it's a very stressful like process yeah. it's a mm -hmm. very stressful part um i had to one of my biggest problems in my younger days was that i have this incredible ball of nerves which wants to just come over take over the whole thing it's literally i would walk into an in an interview with Steven Spielberg in London or um, Sam Mendes uh, when he was still directing theater. And I, I, would, I would get these opportunities. It would be like I was carrying this little invisible box with like Acme TNT on it. And I would just completely collapse into nerves and not being able to function. And uh, the thing which got me out of that is, you know, the going back to class and, and I, in terms of how I like auditions, I still, all those nerves still come up, but I have like a big bag of physical tricks and, and mental tricks 
and ways of just give yourself more to focus on about this part. And remember that, you know, and Brian Cranston talks about this, and I like the way that, like, mm -hmm. that you are presenting, this is what, this is what I think this is. And, you know, and if you can get the, well, I got this job, I got to pay for this bill, you know, if you can get all that out of your head and just go, this is what I want to do with this part. And then, then it's a dialogue and they say, well, you know, try this, try that. And you go, okay, yeah, that sounds right. And they either like you or they don't. They either they might love you, but they get someone sh shorter, taller, you know, uh, younger, older, you know. So you just have I, to accept yeah. that. But I do love auditioning when I can get past all the, all, all the <laughs> nonsense that goes on, you know, mm -hmm. because it's just so, acting. Right? And and I, I wanted to actually bring up Cranston for a moment. I'm happy you mentioned him because... I remember watching something recently where he talks about acting comes down to like when a scene is supposed to be funny, but your character is not acting as if it's funny. Right. And, and the same thing applies for when your character is supposed to cry, but isn't, you know, like that, that, that was where he kind of created that dividing line, you know, about certain things. Right. Do you have any, any types of, yeah, you know, practices like that that you can bring to you know audition or or even a part you have. Um, I do I do things that will physically get me there. Like I might carry like a little rock if I'm feeling like I'm going to be bouncing out. I have like a little rock in my pocket, which just reminds me I'm I'm grounded. Um, I did this show called The Killing, and I, I walked in there, and my dad had this really big kind of knit cable knit cardigan. Which we ended up using as the, in the character, <laughs> yeah. and I had my, I just, I just, I, like my hair was all kind of long, and I, and I and I took my shoes off, and I sort of shuffled into the, you know, and he's sort of a creepy guy, but he, you know, he, I shuffled into the audition with my, sto you know, stocking feet, and 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 it allowed me to just be in, you know, in the character, um, even though it's just like a physical trick, and I can, and if I lean on that, then then all the other stuff can come. I, and every actor is different, but I, I like physical stuff. I like just little physical tricks, breathing. If I can, you know, again, like if I find a, a notion in the accent or, you know, the tone, like where my voice is pitched, you know, like this is me. But like sometimes I play characters which are up in the air like that, you know. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I've sort of lost the question. I, I'm a little ADD, so I probably just yeah. gone off into. Um, no, the question was: Are there any? Uh, uh, yeah, just just more <laughs> like acting process, kind of like oh, what right. Cranston was mm -hmm. talking about. If you, yeah, if, if you, if there's something maybe like reusable as an asset that you can take with you, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it'll be a physical thing or a breathing thing, and I'll do like uh, I'll try and get like I'll do as much work as I can on the lines. And then I'll imagine as I'm walking into the room that I'm jumping off a cliff. And so that however it comes out is how it comes out. Even though I know the lines backwards, forwards, sometimes I start in the middle and learn, you know, and, and uh, I give myself like little goals each time. Like I want to get every word perfect. I want to be completely relaxed. I want to be um, this particular moment. I know what this this feeling is, you know, and I'll, I'll yeah. sort of put myself in there. And cause we never know if we're going to get on the set. I mean, we only know in hindsight, right? So the trick for me is to treat the room, treat the audition. Of course, now it's like in here is where we're doing auditions. Mm -hmm. um, just treat it like, like it's, it's the thing. It is, this is the performance. This is where it starts and ends. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, and I, every act, every actor is different and I don't even know if you can teach acting. I mean, I used to try, but, uh, you'd, some kids would get it. Some people wouldn't. And, um, and, but there are skills you can develop, you know, like vocal skills, physical skills. I mean, having been trained in England, it was kind of like, this is your, you know, this is your, um, you know, um, your instrument. And it's just like little skills you can do. And you can work on your voice and you can learn to sing and you can learn to dance. But acting, it's like, ultimately, it's a question of, of your taste. 
And Alan Rickman talked about you need to, if you read, read stories and let your imagination go into them. And I, I don't know. And I still don't have an answer to that question. Like it's all, it's always changing, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, sense. it kind of feels like it's, it's, it's acting is like most any art form. While you can take like a few mechanical things to help you mm. along the way with the craft, ultimately, like it's always up to the artist to kind of, you know, find yeah. their own way. Uh, there's yeah. only so much teaching can go, uh, can do for you. Yeah, that's true. You have to sort of develop your own taste and your own mm-hmm. drive. Or what is your, what is your goal? You know? Yeah. Still don't know what mine and, is, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we do look back on your career a little bit, Adrian, and if someone were to glance at your IMD page, IMDb page, they would see you have a very, very varied career uh, with roles, which is incredible. And one part or particular roles that we, we enjoy about talking about on the show are villains and how oh. good villains will make or break any story. And you have kind of honed like this craft of villainy and you've been, I think you've been quoted as saying is that you want people, (laughs) you're welcome. Um, You want people to feel bad for the bad guy. Yes. Um, Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit more for us? Well, I just, you know, that nobody, the obvious thing to say is that nobody thinks of themselves as the bad guy, right? But that quite often Bad acts come from a sense of, I want to make this wrong right. Mm-hmm. I want them to know, you know, or, or, or a sort of like my, my favorite is like a sort of like having a deep, a villain having a deep sadness. And like, if you look at Alan Rickman, I mean, that's the way he played Snape. That's the way he played, mm-hmm. you know, the Sheriff of Nottingham. There's always this kind of, uh, you know, this deep sigh about the bad yeah. things he was doing. And I just think it's, it's interesting to kind of explore what makes someone do something bad, not in an intellectual way, but like if I was, you know, oh, okay. There was this one time uh, I played this Southern racist wife beater to Jennifer Beals in this. Uh, and I remember I was struggling with a scene where he, he ends up, he's talking about, um, there's a show that was titled that when we were making it Amanda America, but I think it has a different name now, um, way back in the nineties. And I, there's this big romantic scene where I ask her to marry me. We run off, but she is the daughter of a slave owner, Sam Waterston and, uh, one of his slaves. And, um, it was a very famous book at the time. And the scene I had to do was I had to tell her that I'd found out that she was half cast and I was so uncomfortable with it. And uh, I tried, just tried to kind of play it like a bad guy. And then mm-hmm. the, the, the director was brilliant. He just said, just go faster through the scene. Cause he does this long speech and ends up smacking her and saying like just expletive, horrible words to her in, in racist talk. And, uh, and I just remember that, as an actor at the one point, what, like just going faster, suddenly something clicked and I went, she betrayed him. And there was something about having that notion of betrayal enter my mind. And then it just kind of like, and suddenly the the whole scene just kind of took off. And I, I was horrible. And and like I had to shower for like hours after that that day, but I just remember (laughs) that the scene worked, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I'm like having having to play that. It's it's kind of awkward because if you're, it's not me, but you have to go. Okay, what makes someone? And and for me, if I could get away from the southern racist wife beater dude, dude, I got mm-hmm. into betrayed, and that I knew something about. And so that I just played out of betrayal. Mm-hmm. I mean, so. it, like a, a director probably can't tell you, hey, go observe some racist for a little bit. No. Make sure they're wearing <laughs> the wife beaters. And, right. and see yeah. if you can get into that, you know, like I, yeah. I imagine that that's got to be, maybe that is the reusable thing, Adrian, that you can, mm-hmm. you can find that element, whether it's a human emotion or, mm. you know, some maybe drawing on an experience that you can, you yeah. can reuse like that to, to really put into the character because, um, one of the things I always kind of bounce around when we, when we get to have folks join us like this uh-huh. is how much of yourself do you insert into characters, right? Because 
you have like a, a certain actors are always eating in a role or something, or, <laughs> you know, someone's always sarcastic as, a, as, you know, like a Bill Murray, for example, you know, are there any kinds of things we can look for in your performances that oh God, maybe is a little bit of you put into the role? I don't know. I, I, I like, I don't, I don't think about it like that, but I mean, sure. I'm sure there is. I mean, it's my voice and my body and my face and, and, you know, my emotions, but, uh, I kind of haven't, I haven't thought about like, what is, what is, what is your thing? What is your catchphrase? I don't know. I, 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 sorry. I, it's a, it's a good question. It's just, it's not one that I'm very good at answering because for me, it's always been about sort of pouring myself into another person, you know, into another kind of way of looking at that for me is what, you know, gives me life. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it's a one. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, as I say, when it comes to pouring yourself into a character, do you find characters that are more grounded in realism or easier to pour yourself into? Or do you enjoy kind of playing a more fantastic character? Uh, they find me. I don't know. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think in everything you want to, you want to ground it in some kind of truth, but you know, um, sometimes it's nice to kind of explore the edges of what, what people will believe. Right. And yeah. sometimes you push yourself a little, if you push yourself just a little bit farther, your own notion of reality, you know, gets extended too, you know? I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough question for me. I'm sorry. I'm making it up as I go along. <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to imagine that certain things, like you mentioned, even just the, the attire that you have to wear, like this cardigan mm -hmm. you mentioned, yeah, because that that cardigan took courage to wear i just got to say it, it, that that was cuz when you just explained that character and and kind of like i i honestly expect if there's pockets on that thing anything could be coming out of those right, right. i mean it's so it can sometimes mm -hmm. manifest as a set piece but i think as you kind of mentioned it sounds like you're you're pulling different elements every time it's not like you've got a a cookie cutter that you follow or anything like that right i mean it's yeah no, if it's something physical or, or vocal or, you know, or some little bit of something I remember or dream of, you know, the, the, you can only act what you know or what you dream of. That's mm -hmm. the way I look at it. And so I just say, well, how do I, how do I dream out loud is basically the way I describe acting to myself. It's just basically, basically dreaming out loud. So what if I was, you know, what if this was happening? But yeah, physical stuff really helps me because then it makes helps me believe that I am the character or some, or helps me believe that other people will believe. Right. <laughs> so you know, you'd have to you know, like little t shirt changes or shirt changes, like you just little suit and tie to audition for someone who's like a little bit more, you know, business like than I instinctively am. You know, so uh, yeah, I I love that you kind of went there because. As we talk about the attire that you dress in for a role, Joe and I, of course, are are very big fans of Assassin's Creed, and I'm sure you've you've met a lot of us in your travels along the way. A few, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, for that role though, the, the, you guys were on the cutting edge at that time. Yeah. Adding the the physical presence to a video game character where That's motion right. capture wasn't wasn't really happening. Now we happen to hear the other half of some of these these uh scenes that you acted in with noah watts oh yeah and I, I one thing i wanted to clarify first was he mentioned that he gave some death stares to the producers and the directors of that of, of certain sequences is that true or was he just kind of giving us a little bit of fluff I, I, i'm curious to know if you remember death this stares not. um he might have I, I might not have noticed because I was too busy going, okay, we're doing 38 scenes today. I have monologues in five of them. And what page <laughs> oh, no. are we on? And what's, <laughs> but, and, but, you know, and then, but when we worked together, yeah, the, there was some interesting stuff went on there because of course it was an indigenous story, right? That they had written. And um, I know that, that Genedia Horn, uh, you know, she, who is Mohawk, uh, she, um, you know, and she, there's a, particular bit of Canadian history which in which she was a child in and and she was she speaks quite publicly about it she's a oh my god she's a powerful powerful woman and I fucking admire her um uh but uh, she she got an an uncle or an aunt to help do the um 
the translations of the Mohawk language for the for the game because they didn't they didn't have it at the beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I know that Noah, you know, you know, being Crow and an indigenous himself, I mean, he was certainly he was. I I wouldn't put it past him to have done that. You know, we were, you know, as actors in that, you know, situation, it's not like you're working with a film director or a theater director. These are people who are directing the game, the overall thing. And so we were actually given quite a lot of uh, scope to figure out how these scenes work. And uh, of course, it's all on a volume. So you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. You can't see costumes. You've got this helmet on your head and at first when we started these helmets would you know capture face facial stuff and 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 where your head is in space they had these huge great huge three three or four cables this thick coming out of the back so they had oh. to hire <laughs> they had to hire people so like especially when we're circling each other right and doing all these mm-hmm. things they had to hire people to sort of hold those and make sure we didn't cross <laughs> wires because then we'd be like oh you know um but it was a real to do, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. but it, it's funny because no, the first thing that happened, I was cast early when they were just sort of working on the game. And this is going back to Noah again. Um, and then I went in and I did like a week of we did a few scenes and then it sort of went away. And then we sort of they brought us back. And the guy who had played, you know, Connor in the you know, the working, working it out uh, version, which they didn't, I guess, mm-hmm. use, had been replaced by Connor. And th- there was part of me, which was like, it's, it would be so easy for me to just to sort of plow over the other actor in the scene and just like, uh, what, what do you think? And just be hate them and that, and that kind of, but what, mm-hmm. what Noah gave me in, in my performance was he gave me opposition and, and, and Genia Dio as well. And it was, uh, because there's a way in which that would have been so easy for me to just kind of like, just, uh, I'm, you know, because I felt really, you know, in control. But working mm-hmm. with Noah, he was like, he was, you know, he wouldn't let his, my character get away with anything. So I, I had to find other ways of, of, you know, dealing with, with his character. And, and I, you know, and it was, it was just freaking glorious, man, because, you know, working with those guys and, and, you know, um, Neil, who played uh, Lee, and um, yeah, you know a bunch of other people who sort of you know played uh, played other parts in it. Um, mm-hmm. Where it's just, it was just a joy, and and of course, you know I'd been on stage, I'd been on television, I'd been on film, and I'd never worked in a volume like that. And so we had to, we got to kind of play and say, well, I wonder what shot they're going to use for this scene. And so, okay, if I was directing the scene, I would probably do this one a little, maybe a little over, which turns into a double two shot. And so, I, like, mm-hmm. I would, I would start playing with the because we got to do this over like a year, a year and a half, um, yeah. and uh, like this whole rooftop scene, which starts with him. I can't, I can't remember what he says, but I, I just, I just this little grunt, and I'm don't look at him because I know that it's going to be a two shot over me, even though there's no cameras. It's just like they're. They're capturing this and they're capturing where we are. They're just capturing data. Anyway, and in the end, like I said, I wonder if I can turn this into a close up or maybe it's an over onto him and like, oh, then it's a wide shot. So, so I, cha- I would just slightly play with the performance of it and mm-hmm. to see how much, you know, how much control do we have? And, and actually, the, the quite a lot of it we did have. And that also could be really good writing. Right, which just made me respond yeah. in a way which made you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's a, it's a really interesting uh, conglomeration of things, but it was it was really cool to do it. And I said, we, nobody, this is early. This is in like you know, and then halfway through, suddenly the cords weren't on on the helmets anymore, which you know, <laughs> but they were still really <laughs> tightly mm-hmm. gripped to your head, and and you know those little tight dot costumes, tight you know dot tights that we were wearing. <laughs> <laughs> we're mm-hmm. not comfortable i, I can imagine I, I, and b- yeah. before we get away from Haytham, i am i am interested to know like you you did say that uh this does come down to good writing uh of the characters and yeah. uh you talked about the back and forth that you you got to have with noah and how um he wouldn't let you necessarily take a scene i do have to say i mean Haytham does kind of command almost every scene that he's in uh, obviously the other protagonist the protagonist will try and keep that from happening but 
because this is like this was a character who hadn't really existed in the Assassin's Creed franchise yet. Right. Of having this villain who didn't seem to be a villain for the sake of being a villain or just right. like having total control like the others. And because you did kind of have this still control over most scenes that you were in, I'm just you're like, how much of Hatham did you really develop um, <laughs> outside of what was outside of what was written well, for you? Yeah, I just said I just said to myself, he's a true believer. You know, like he has that wonderful speech on the rooftop when it's why do you, why do your people do what they do? And he goes, Yes. Order, mm -hmm. purpose, and direction. No more than that. It's your and then so that you know and so I, then I'm gonna fight for this guy's point of view. And then what would drive someone across the ocean to go and you know, he he's gotta be a true believer. You know, it's not kind of cynical. I just want to do evil things. Um, there's a kind of uh, you know, true believer in some kind of order in life. You know, and people people wrote like um, <laughs> a book about his childhood after as well. And they said, yeah. did that book? You know, and I, and I was like, that's sort of, sort of interesting. But no, I, I just, mm -hmm. I said, I, I remember telling myself, if this is a thing, if I get to play this role, then I'm just, going to give it everything as if it's as if it's like a movie and i get to play this role and so that's what i did it's like it's like a combination of being in the theater and being and being in a film because you can be very very subtle and you can be very very large and and both things are bought by the, the medium so i i will say that i've mm -hmm. heard i've heard several actors say that sometimes we're just taking what's on the page and we're and it's it's very powerful and, and a lot of this in assassin's creed 3 was however i want to tip my cap to you specifically because you actually shared one of the scenes where you said you had a lot of runway to work with and specifically it was when hatham sees the first people's vault for the first time right. and he gets to see the light sequence on the door yeah. and th to me yes you can be directed to do certain things but in that sequence though I mean, I, I just kind of sat back and my jaw dropped. I just went, wow, I can like see the, the determination from Hatham in the previous scene. Mm -hmm. And then you can see him completely stripped down yeah. of, of all of that. The bottom so, drops out of his world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, like I, I recognized that in the scene and, uh, you know, that they sent to Dio and I out into like a little green room that we had with lots of, lots of good snacks to, to, figure out the blocking of that scene. And, and I said, what if, like, I'm just going to drop. And what, if, what, you know, what if you came up and you just took my hand or something like that? And she goes, all right, it does it. And then, you know, and then we, but, but then she sort of like, she just like brought the whole thing alive. And when she did that, it just allowed me to kind of go to drop. And, you know, he can't be, I just thought he, he can't be just perfectly impervious. There has yeah. to be a moment where he has like, sadness or you know and again it goes back into like the villain antagonist character who who who's got like a heart and there's another scene i think when you you know right at the end right at the end of that, still I, i'm proud of you boy you know yeah <laughs> and, he's talking, and 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 yet he says something terrible at the, just after that and i can't i don't remember the line right now but I should, oh yes, I should have killed you long ago. Yeah. No, that was yes. last, mm -hmm. As he collapsed into that. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was fun to, fun to play too. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, again, like he, he it would have been boring for me to, I think, to, to just play him like, I'm just an evil son of a bitch. No, there's, there's, a, there's a story behind there. There's a, there's a heart in there, even though mm -hmm. it's completely misdirected, however you may judge it. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah, that was, yeah, that was fun to do. I, I feel like there's got to be a part of like video game development, especially with story writing. It's called what makes a good man, because the story of Hatham is, is fascinating to me because in that game, in that vacuum, you, you feel like the dial could turn just a little bit each way and he could be a good guy versus a bad guy. Mm -hmm. But, but then when you get the story of Rogue where you got to reprise his role and, and then you get to see the motivations behind why he does the things that he does. It actually made me go, 
Maybe I actually should have supported him more than I did. Good. <laughs> well, that's my whole yeah. part of my evil plan. Yeah. <laughs> it is kind of like, you know, I want, I want you to root mm-hmm. for, for the guy that you don't want to root for. You know, and I, and yeah. I think that when I watch movies, I, I, I love watching somebody who you shouldn't root for and that you still follow for some reason. Yeah. So thank you. I'll take I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's the one thing I I continually think about because Joe and I have this this uh, process where we'll go back and replay certain games every year. Right. And and for me, I actually replay Rogue quite a bit because I love that story. I love the plot twist and how you know how that that uh, that sudden change to his backstory transforms the character completely. Um, right. And so. I don't know. Maybe it's the justification for the rage, and and maybe as a parent, that's something that's just hitting home uh, for me. But uh, you know, the it's, rage. it's yeah, yeah, just a little bit, just a little okay. bit of that. Um, but yeah, I I think it's it's just a I, I love the portrayal, I love the character, and uh, mm-hmm. I I was also well, looking you. back to uh, to some memories about Assassin's Creed Three. I don't want to make it too heavily about it, but how much fun was it for you? to ad lib on this panel at Comic Con where you guys literally did the entire family just kinda Oh my gosh, you know, yeah, Andy May. I was in Sacramento yeah. about ten years yeah. ago. That was that was it was so first of all, it was cool to see everybody and and like mm-hmm. all those guys and all the games are hysterical folks and, and a lot of fun to hang out and and then of course you know no, Noah pops up with this thing, and like, and then I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just best him, and then he, he smacks, he knocks it out of the park. I don't remember the line exactly, but I just remember, <laughs> oh, oh, got, oh, you got me. Yeah, it's, 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 it's super fun to hang out with those guys. I mean, conventions are are a blast, right? I, I just happened to watch it where you said. Uh, why don't you go clean your room? And he says, I, I would if you hadn't burnt it down, Father. <laughs> That's right. That was it. That was, oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there's always a part of me that wonders if, if the casts of certain games will kind of reconnect like the like the perfect season Miami Dolphins would have, you know, like do you do you, do you get a chance to interact much? Because I know you don't really do con circuits nearly as much as, as other folks might. I'm doing a few more now for I think, yeah. various reasons. Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, I keep in touch. You know, I, I have, actually haven't been in touch with, with Noah, um, you know, but I, we have our social medias. And I keep in touch with, with, with Neil a fair bit. Um, he played Lee, right? And uh, and his family, his partner, and, and you know, there's Elias Tefexis, whom I know fairly well, who's like Deus Ex. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Yeah, you kind of like the 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 getting to go play together. The job is quite often the biggest part of it. And then, of course, if it's over, and then it's like, well, do I want to, or do I go to the next thing? But yeah, yeah. over the over the years, there, you sort of collect a few people that you really bonded with, and and then they become pals for for life. Yeah, no, but I mean, you know, I I, I look forward to to any time I get to hang with those guys because it's always fun. I mean, Neil was hysterical. Noah was great. Kenny Dio was like, you know, on, I like I adore her, but but as a she's so strong that she's almost a little terrifying. And uh, <laughs> but like I have such respect and 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 you know and, and you know we we chat every now and then, but it's not a mm-hmm. it's not a big social club, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you you'd yeah. mentioned you're 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 kind of picking up more. Uh, you said you're picking up more cons. Um, what what is an, I guess like what what do you enjoy about going from con to con? Because I know depending on like how big the con is, sometimes maybe it's just like a conveyor belt of fans, and smaller ones maybe less so. So yeah, what what's what's kind of like the I guess a bright spot of of living a con life or or being at them? Well, p- people say wonderful stuff to you about you know that we the well, i did one recently which is just basically a reunion of all the original x-men actors which of which yeah. i was one um i did two episodes back in the 90s um playing the nightcrawler and uh but just you know seeing lenore again and uh mm-hmm. seeing chris Britton, whom i know fairly well and and you know george booza and, and uh i i had to like the first thing i had to say with, to george was i used to uh I used to kind of say, actually, I'm one of the, I'm the only actor who was in both the original animated series and the movies. And then someone kind of went up to me one day and said, you know, George Dusel wasn't the one for you, right? You too. <laughs> oh. Oh. 
<laughs> so, okay. God, just watch what you say. You know, you <laughs> watch what you brag about, you know? Um, but uh, no, yeah. So, I mean, I, I was an X-Men 3. I played Jean Grey's dad and, yeah. and you know, obviously. Uh, but yeah, it was, but the con thing, it's, it's just, it's lovely to, you know, and people come and they say, the very first one I did, um, actually, one of my handlers uh, was this Chilean lad who was like in his mid twenties, and he he said he would, and you could, people get quite drunk in the bar, and he he's uh, you know he said I have to tell you something, and when I was a kid, my mom brought me here from Chile, and and I didn't I had to learn English, and so she put me in front of in front of the X Men, and and I learned English watching listening to you guys talk, and I was like oh my god this this thing meant something yeah. to someone and for me it was just like you know i it was years before right it was just this thing mm -hmm. that i didn't think was ever going to be significant um but it sure was fun to do it was my very first uh, the nightcrawler was my very first animated audition i'd done a few oh, you know no like way. commercial mm -hmm. things yeah well I, my agent had just gone and joined this voice agent and so they had mm -hmm. this and uh and he said, come and see me, Adrian. The voice agent came in and said, well, what do you do? And, uh, and then my agent said, well, he does accents and things. And, oh, okay. So I got like a, a, a southern, or like a, a frozen concentrated orange juice commercial <laughs> and like voice thing. <laughs> and then, then he, she calls up and says, do you do a German accent? One of the very first accents I learned while I was in the UK was, was German. And like, so I did, a, I learned a Norwegian accent as well because I was trying to get this Norwegian part in the show uh didn't get it but and, you know i collected the norwegian but so yes i so i walked in there and uh and i saw the script which was that whole thing look in your heart hello and all that stuff and that long quite wonderful speech and i just kind of put you know, it was one of those things that just clicked and you know i don't know it's just like the magic day and i sort of walked in and said oh, i don't want to try this and so i uh and it, it just having the script in, in my hand, it just kind of flowed and it was, you know, really well written. And I just, and I, I just, I didn't think of it like a cartoon. Like I wasn't going to try and do like a little voice. I just wanted to give him a real heart. And, you know, it sort of, I finished my take and like right out of the gate and the, the voice direct kind of went, he's a very passionate guy. <laughs> and I went, yeah. Do you want to do it again? Okay. So I did it again. And then that was the next thing I knew. I was in like a week later, I was in the studio with Lenore and Cal, who taught me, those guys taught me what it meant to be a voice actor. Because it's not just, you're not, you're not like a shut, shut with just a mic. You're just not doing this. There's like Cal, he would like, he was really, he'd, he'd like muscle up and, and make his fists and hey, listen here, bub, you know? And, <laughs> and of course, Lenora's got this incredible gravelly thing that she does. And, and she's got such an amazing energy. And, uh, was this Norm? Norm Spencer was there. May he rest in peace. And, uh, a couple of others. And I think, yeah, and that was my first day in an animation studio and, and those guys. And so seeing them again at a convention is just mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, how are you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how many kids have you had since then? You know, what happened? Divorces, marriages, what? You know, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, Lenore's had a whole career as a politician. She's she was like elected wow. four times. For, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then she yeah. went, okay, enough of that. I'm going to go back and be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's, a, there's a part of this that's funny to me because it's, it's full circle in a way. So Hugh Jackman let people know that when he first began playing the role of Wolverine, he took cold showers as a way to prepare for him, as a way to get into the mind space. Right. And you being connected to the X-Men property and going down to the ocean and getting into the cold water, it's almost like you've, without knowing, you, you've almost adopted that same preparation process <laughs> right i guess yeah, i guess <laughs> I, but do you come out of the water it's funny your voice is right up here um no but uh no the uh mm -hmm. yeah no i don't know but i mean i, I just i mean i've always loved i mean i was i was a, mm -hmm. a swimmer when i was at school and a basketball player and you know i was also in the theater department so that the jocks would look at me and go 
what are you doing? And like the, the you know, the, the theater department said, aren't you a jock? You know, so I've had this kind of <laughs> weird split personality in high school. So, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, um, so I mean, swimming was, you know, something I like to do, but, you know, I, I, but, you know, everyone goes through stuff in their lives and, and yeah. I guess about 12 years, there some pretty heavy stuff was going on. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, one of the ways that I dealt with my anxiety is I just, would take my screaming brain and my anxious gut down to the water and I'd just go for a swim. And I started doing it at like weird times of year, like March and April. It And it wasn't even like consciously, I must go and heal myself. It was like, uh, <laughs> it was just like, I gotta go swim. And, and you know, so I just go on. A, and it's the next, there's something about entering frozen water, which takes all those thoughts that, you don't need a way. Mm-hmm. And the only thing is you have to survive. You have to survive now. This is too <laughs> cold. You're going to die. And, uh, and so, and, but there's something so calming about that and I can't yeah. describe it, but that, that doing, you know, throwing yourself mm-hmm. into extra stress is somehow like relieved the stress anyway. So I just kept I, doing it. I mean, it sounds like it's math with two negatives making a positive, and no one understands why. No one explains why. Right. That's just what happens. <laughs> That's right. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. We have talked a good deal about your past, a little bit about your present, and I, I think Mark and I were both uh, kind of wondering, you know, while you have done so much with your career and have, have played so many different characters, what would you still want to do, or is there any... Anything you're looking forward to do yet in your career as far as acting goes? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know what form it's going to take, mm-hmm. but I know that there's more in me. And, and when people say, what's your favorite role? It's always in my mind, the next one, you know, mm-hmm. that, um, I, yeah, I mean, the trouble is that when you, when you, when you get a really good audition, quite often it's, um, it's attached to a thing called an NDA. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, you know, I couldn't, I can't, I couldn't say if or n- something was mm-hmm. coming up for me that is exciting or not. Um, but I feel, I mean, so much of being an actor is like having this kind of bizarre faith that something's going to work out. And I mm-hmm. find that it always does. And um, except when it doesn't. And then it doesn't for a while and then it does. And then it suddenly it does for a while. And then, you, you know, it's like this kind of roller coaster, you know, feast and mm-hmm. famine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what form the role is going to take. It's just like, I'm, I'm looking forward to something which uses a lot, a lot of my skills and a lot of my uh, um, passions, I guess. So. And yeah. also save the save the temperate rainforest. That's that's what I'm looking yes. for. Yes, mm-hmm. I, I, you know what? I was actually going to mention that because we're 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 definitely. I think we're we're at the we're nearing the end of the conversation. And of course, we like we always say that you've survived a digital dissection, so we appreciate you doing that for <laughs> us. But just to show that me point, up well, okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, but to that point, though, we like to give our guests the floor at the end. I mean, if there are any any uh, causes, advocacy, anything you'd like to speak about, we're more than happy to give you the floor. Right. Um, well, I mean, I, I, over the last few years, I've been sort of involved in in trying to predict the last one percent of the old growth forest giants that that exist in in British Columbia, which is a huge province. In 150 years of of Canadian colonial occupation, we've re- re- managed to cut down 95% of the forest overall. And um, like there's only 1% of these incredible trees, which some of them are like 3000 years old, which is, you know, I mean, and, and the more research they're doing into them and the whole systems is that they exist as these complex systems that communicate with each other through the mycelium, the mushroom, fungi underneath and you know at a certain age there's like whole other ecosystems that exist only in a tree 250 years old and older and then other ones on top of that so we're like we're kind of we we thought that we could turn things into tree farms right and so just keep Mm -hmm. on logging and keep on logging but they you know they're re-logging 
trees that are only like 60 years old and that is a baby tree you know mm-hmm. yeah and the whole ecosystem it you know needs i mean i talked to an indigenous friend of mine uh the other day and she said you know things things going this way now but things always bounce back and i thought that was a, a wonderful uh, way of looking at it because yeah, we're you know a lot of people are arguing about climate change and biodiversity loss and all this kind of stuff and it's become a very kind of highly charged fight but you know i think we can agree that we are nature and if we kill that nature then we're also next and mm-hmm. so i i just you know i mm-hmm. i have to pick and choose okay this is something that's near to me like you know i can drive an hour and a half two hours down the road and find one of these trees or one of these groves um but all the time on the way there you're driving through endless clear cuts and replantations and if there's one you know if, if i can bring attention to it you know i i but uh, you know so much of the stuff is not in our our control all we can do is going to put pressure on the people for whom it is on and they're in their control anyway that's that's what i got to say about that <laughs> yeah yeah, I, 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 worthy cause, and and to be honest with you, I thought when The Last of Us started to get a lot of press, people were starting to explain how mycelium works and how how right. it can operate as a fungus for the purpose of the show. Yeah. But then, to your point, some of that light got shed on these these like super organisms that are all connected by it. Right. Yeah. And and suddenly, people are like, "Holy crap! That's not just a a science fiction idea. That's a real yeah. thing." And it's like, "Yeah, it exists. We're killing it." We shouldn't be, yeah. You know, so I, I definitely think it's a absolutely worthy cause to to shed light right on. There's a really interesting guy called Paul Stamus who's done a bunch of TED talks about how mushrooms are going to save the world, and I uh, highly recommend it. But uh, yeah. follow, and follow him as well on Instagram. So. Yeah, I, and and honestly, uh, how can folks find you, Adrian? We we'd love to help uh, direct some folks to your your socials here. Well, I'm on Real Adrian Huff uh, on Instagram. I'm A D E Y eighty 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 on the nearly called X. Um, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm so I'm sort of, I'm I'm finding myself pulling away a little bit from some of these things, as, you know. But but I do I can you know, I'll, I'll I'll post like nice ocean pictures, and occasionally something will grab me that I have to I express this. Um, yeah, those are the those are the two main ones. Cool. Well, Great. in the meantime, mm-hmm. we will absolutely be looking out for your next ocean visit, as well as <laughs> as any poetry that you might be saving for us. <laughs> okay. and, and, and we lo- we look forward to supporting you throughout that, as well as projects we can't talk about yet. So, projects we're... we cannot talk about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Whatever well... they may be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And with that, we would like to thank you, the Dissection Crew, for everything you do for us week in and week out. It really does go a long way with all the support that you give us. And if you happened upon our show by accident today, if you could subscribe, like, and maybe leave a review for us, it'd really help out. And of course, we like hearing from you, so feel free to message us over at digitaldissectionpodcast at gmail.com. We like to welcome all of your ideas for future shows and, well, anything you'd like to share. I'm Adrian Huff, and until next time, keep on dissecting.